Why y'all look all nervous? Huh? It's cool. I don't keep you under there too long. Oh, yeah, I can see it. They said he can't smoke. Good morning, good morning, good morning. That's me. Oh, okay. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, amen. It's been a, uh, another eventful weekend. Uh, this was the Sin Relief uh, weekend. We had over 600 volunteers from 10 different states come and serve in like 45 different communities yesterday. Um, between Friday and Saturday, uh, just doing a million projects all around the city. We went all over, starting in Kensington, and just just been working and praying and seeing the body of Christ. It was uh, every ethnicity working together, coming from all over, um, and that's one of the beautiful things about uh, our Southern Baptist family that we have the most diverse body of Christ there is that comes together. And so last night, it, it ended with me preaching out at Ezekiel Baptist. Uh, so I'm kind of worn out. But just the interviews this morning, um, some of you uh, were more funny um, than others, and I won't share any names, David. Um, and so... Um, <laughs> You know, it's just been a joy uh, to, to be with uh, some of my folks. And so, as it's been mentioned, today's a special day because we have four baptism candidates. Woo! And four people receiving the right hand of fellowship. Yeah! Those who have completed their new discipleship uh, curriculum. Uh, we're happy for them, and the truth is, besides folks getting saved and, and baptized, I think interviewing, interviewing uh, <laughs> is probably uh, the most fun. Interviewing individuals who come to my office like it's the principal's office. <laughs> I, I don't understand what the problem is, you know. But interviewing and, and just finding out how Great Commission came to be your home and what you feel the Lord is doing in your life, like that's a joy. For I look forward to that. Uh, and yet, folks come up to my office like, hey, you know, like, uh oh. You know, like, so, um, you know, declaring your new life in Christ, inviting friends and family to come celebrate. That's, that's what this is all about, man. So, uh, it's a good day. We celebrate the Right Hand of Fellowship. Right Hand of Fellowship is not just a, a tradition in a church, it's, it's biblical. Amen? Amen. Amen. And in Galatians uh, chapter 2, verse 9, uh, I want to read that before I pray. It says, when James, Cephas, and John, those recognized as pillars, acknowledged the grace that had been given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to me and Barnabas, agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day you've given us. Thank you for these candidates that lives you have entered into. They have confessed you as Lord and Savior, and they're demonstrating that by being baptized. We thank you for those who've chosen to make GCC home, demonstrated that through their commitment to attend classes to learn more about you and about this church that's called to serve you, Lord. And so we thank you for the new family that you brought in, Lord. Now, bring forth this word that will minister to us new uh, and those of us who are standing on the side dating. Uh, and for those who are members, remind us why we get the right hand of fellowship or why we become a part of a fellowship, a body that you call your bride for your glory. Use me, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And so, we're talking about the right hand of fellowship today, and in Galatians chapter 2, I get to visit this this uh, chapter once a, a year, 
um, to to go back and really show where the Right Hand Fellowship come from, to, to show why we have agreed to be a part of fellowship and unity within one another. And so taking it from the top of Galatians chapter 2, it says, Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. I went up according to a revelation and presented to them the gospel I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to those recognized as leaders, I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running in vain. And, and, and so I know uh, so many people outside of the church that believe they are good because they got a relationship with the Lord. They don't believe they need a church. They don't believe in what they call organized religion. But the truth is, you can't say you love Jesus, you follow Jesus, and you obey Jesus, and then say, but I don't like your bride. I don't support the entity that you went to the cross and died for. Y'all know my bride? Yes. Yes. Uh, Shorty in the back, in the blue. Uh, you know, I crack on her like 80, 70, so y'all know, like, that's, that's my joint, right? You can't really say you like me, but you don't like my bride. Because if you got a problem with my bride, you got a problem with me, right? Uh, Pastor Anderson, cool, but I don't really speak to his wife. Mm -hmm. No, but Pastor Anderson ain't cool. We ain't like that, right? Right? The church is the bride of Christ. When he went to the cross and died for him. You can't say I love Jesus, but your church. Now, I get it. Some church people. Go mm ahead. -hmm. You can say I love Jesus, but I don't like someone praying for you. Because truth be told, I don't look, no, 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 y'all good, good. Not, not this one, but you know. Some church people can be a bit much, amen. But, listen, the Lord has called us into fellowship. And, and, and Paul says, I was preaching for 14 years. I make my way back to Jerusalem. I make my way to see the apostles to get their opinion, to get their approval, to get their acceptance of my apostleship and my ministry. Paul communicates with the apostles what he had been preaching during his journey. He sought this private meeting with them to discuss his ministry, to discuss the calling he had on his life. Paul was, was a leader in life. He was growing as a leader in the church. And he was very knowledgeable about the word. He had an experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. He had his Damascus Road experience. Acts chapter 9, he went from Saul to Paul. He went from persecuting uh, the church to becoming a preacher for the church. Paul was, was transformed. That's what the day is about. The day is about being transformed. He got his preaching orders from Jesus himself. Yet, he still recognized his need to be a part of of a fellowship and to have accountability. Yeah, yeah. And so I think what Galatians 2, 1 and 10 pull out is five characteristics, I say, that should be present when you're joining a church. And number one is affirmation. Paul says in, 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 in verse 2, he wanted to make sure he wasn't running his race, his, his race in vain. Yeah. Paul was ministering to the Gentiles, right, or which we would call the uncircumcised people. And they were being discriminated against. They was being ostracized from the fellowship uh, because they, they, they wasn't circumcised. And they were being forced to become circumcised as if salvation was dependent on the cutting of the flesh. Now, Paul understood and, 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 and that we are all saved by grace through faith. Amen? Amen. And, and, and so, in other words, besides... Believing and accepting the finished word of the Lord Jesus Christ, right through his death, burial, and resurrection, we have no other part in our salvation event. And so Paul knew if the leaders, if the apostles, 
we're, we're, we're holding the Gentiles to the circumcision standard, then, then his ministry will be hindered because he's teaching a different gospel. He's teaching, his teaching wasn't coinciding with, with theirs. And so Paul didn't just go to receive affirmation. Paul wanted to make sure that they were on the same page, right? It's sometimes what we call dating the church. You know, you come and you've been looking and you're watching and you're listening and you know, first I'm going to go online. I ain't even going to go for I'm going to go online. I'm going to see if I can feel it out there. And if it's okay there, then I'll come in and see how they treat me. Right? And then based on that, I'm going to then make a decision. It's a year done passed, and I'm still sitting. No, that's cool. No, no, that's cool. I ain't calling nobody out. I see you. Know, Stop laughing. You're giving yourself away. So... <laughs> What I'm saying is, in general, hypothetically, this happens, right? You come and you date and then you watch, right? And, and, but Paul didn't go there grandstand. He didn't go there about his ministry abilities and how great he was. He approached the apostles in a humble way, privately to discuss whatever doctrinal differences they might have had. And this is important, right? It's important because when, when we do uh, find a place, because all churches don't do churches the same, let's be clear, right? I done walk in some places and try to figure out where I'm at. I, 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 you know, I done got a bachelor's in Bible, a master's in divinity, a doctorate in ministry, and I still sat there like, what are they talking about? What page is that on? Like, so, so I get it. I done walked in some places and, and oh man, you talking about uncomfortable. You know, you can't sit here, you can't walk there, you can't do this, you can't do that. Like, yo, hi, I'm a visitor. Like, 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 yo, like, cut some slack, right? Like, you go to some place, like, well, I thought this is where you found grace. And yet, you receive none. He's like, jeez. Right? Like, wow. And it's a funeral. You know? <laughs> I think you at least be faking it for the funeral. At least you're going to put on a nice face. <laughs> anyway, right? But you go, you know, and you're trying to figure out what is this place, right? And, and, and sometimes, you know, when we're not well versed in the Bible, we'll, we'll see something and we can confuse a church tradition or a church preference with the word of God, right? And it's why when we interview all of our candidates, we always ask them, you guys, everybody who's a member here, do you have any questions? Anything you want to ask, anything you thought, seen, wondered about, any, anything, the sky's the limit on the question you can ask, right? You know, because I want them to understand, like, no, we're not a perfect church, but we do serve a perfect God, right? And we work on all of these things together. Always, there's two things I need to get right. Love God, love people, right? We get them too right. I'm, like, I'm willing to get some things wrong if we get those two things right. Right? So a person joining a new church, they need to seek that affirmation. It, God, is this where you would have me to be? Right? And then we want the, the church to, to recognize us, affirm us, and welcome us into the fellowship. So the first thing you look for is affirmation. The second thing we look for in the church is biblical confirmation. Go back to the text, verse 3. But not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus in order to enslave us. But we did not give up and submit to these people for even a moment so that the truth of the gospel would be preserved for you. Hmm? You see that? Some false brothers infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ. You know, I was interviewing a brother, and I'm not going to say who he is, but he said, Pastor, I know when I came, I was sitting in the corner in the cut. You gave me this look, like who the boy? <laughs> right? He said, I think you even asked somebody, who the boy? Right? He said, but then over the course of time, as I kept coming back, you went from just shaking my head and nodding, like, yeah, I see you, to actually giving me a grip and giving me a hug. And I'm like, oh, I guess I done made it in now. You know? And I told Ray, I'm not saying no name. I said, look at Ray. Sometimes brothers come rolling in here, look 
looking like sheep. But they really wolves. Some men come up in the church just to try to take advantage of the young women in our church. My job as the shepherd of this church is to make sure that's not your agenda. I say so every man that walks in this church, he's going to get an eye at some point and let him know it ain't sweet. Like half the pastoral staff from North Philadelphia. Right? All the pastoral staff carry. Right? So it's like, I need you to know that you're not going to just come up in here and take advantage. Ray was like, I just went the gospel. I, didn't, I went to him. <laughs> but, but, you know, we all, we all trying to get somewhere. We all growing. Ain't hey, 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 that what I said, Ray? Amen. Hey, you know, I ain't mean to put you out. It just came in my spirit. <laughs> you know, but, but there was some false teaching out there based on some Old Testament customs. And Paul brought Titus an uncircumcised Gentile believer up into the body to see how the apostles would act, to see if they was going to treat him differently. See, Paul clearly taught and he understood, as we can read in 1 Corinthians 17, 7 and 19, that circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. And therefore, it's not about circumcision of the flesh. It's about circumcision of the heart, right? And, and Paul wanted to know that that this church was a place where he could bring his friends, right? Because when you get saved and when you get excited about the Lord and what he's doing in your life, you know, you want to share that. You want to invite family and friends into that. You want them to come to know the God you know, and you want them to come to your place of worship. But you know you want them to feel comfortable when they get there, Right? You want them to find a place that's Bible preaching, teaching, and living. And, and Paul, he wanted to know, like, do y'all really believe this gospel of love that y'all sharing? Are we really one in Christ? Are we really allowing the word of God to be the authority as opposed to tradition or our preference, right? Nobody wants to invite a church they're going to be embarrassed when somebody come into, right? You want to feel like this is where you want to be. And, and Paul looking at these dated Jewish laws and expectations and, and, and he's thinking about his crew, right? And he's like, look, we refuse to give in to this behavior or to this tradition even for a moment, right? He's like, I'm not going to, to no place that I'm embarrassed to invite Titus to, right? I, I can't be at a place where I fear they were here teaching that that's not biblical, right? I, I wouldn't want anybody to experience treatment that's not Biblical, right? And, and you know, I've, I've heard about places where women, if you have on pants, you can't get in. You have on jewelry, they, they tell you you got to take that off, right? No, th th this is this is true. I, I've heard about places where if you were an unwed mother, they bring you up to the front and almost torture you alive, right? Just yesterday, a friend of mine posted that he went to visit this church. Um, over the weekend, and it was like a Friday night service. It was a Friday night service, and he had his hat on, and they told him either take it off or leave. Wow. Take it off or leave. And he called them out on Facebook. Right? <laughs> <laughs> man I mean, but imagine. Imagine getting a young man off the car. I can't tell you the people who I saw yesterday in the ministry. And I can't imagine if I got Somebody from, from Kensington. Somebody from True Avenue. I got somebody on the corner that I was talking to that I'm praying with to come to church. And they come in with a hat on and they pants sagging. And one of y'all told them to leave, pull up their pants and take off their hat. Right? You know, that's a problem. Right? And, and when, when we put people out, right, and we finally got them to come in, but we want them to leave because of their outward appearance, right? I, I need us to understand, right? if, if, if you can't go to the house of God and find love and find refuge, right? Where can you actually go, right? Because what we're actually saying is, 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 is this. Imagine saying, although you're not saved, we would appreciate it if you look like it. Right? Imagine saying that, right? I, I know you're not saved, but... But you might 
ain't dressing up and looking like you say. He like, where is that in the book? Like, show me what page. Show me what page that on. Well, I think is I think what, what, what's worse is is you are saved, but that's not enough. Your mind becoming Jewish first. See, Paul was like, what? Uh, no. Uh, you, you can't really say come as you are, right? And then reject me as I am. Right? So, so Paul was looking for affirmation. He was looking for biblical confirmation. Then third, he was looking for a church that was God-centered and not man-centered. Look at verse 6. It says, now from those who recognize as important, you know, them important guys, the ones who sit up in front in those chairs, right? <laughs> Not your, oh, I didn't know y'all was up here. I thought y'all were up here. Right? Those recognize as important. He said, what they once were make no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to me. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter was for the circumcised, since the one at work in Peter for an apostleship to the circumcised was also at work in me for the Gentiles. He wanted a church that was God-centered, not man-centered. Paul wanted to be clear, I am not a fan. I am not starstruck with Peter, who was Cephas, James, or John, right? I'm not going to Jerusalem because they are Christian celebrities. He wasn't trying to be down with the mega church pastors. Paul says, God is not impressed with your flesh, right? It's, it's easy for people to gravitate towards the popular places, but the truth is God must be the, the, the star of the story, right? Not, not, not the preacher, not the choir director, not the worship leader. God must be the star of the story. Every story, every message, every song must have God as the one getting the glory, right? And, and, and so Paul went there. He said because the apostles were there. Those who had walked with Jesus was there. And he went there, you know, because they were commissioned by Jesus. Paul wanted their affirmation. He wanted their commissioning of him to continue preaching this gospel. And, and, and this is crucial, right? Because this is why people are licensed. This is why we just ordained our deacons and deaconess. Because somebody besides you should recognize and affirm your gifts and your call, right? Each person should have their gifts examined, should have their gifts affirmed, and then they need to be empowered to participate in ministry that God has equipped and called them to do. This is why all of our new members take that spiritual gift test. Y'all wonder why y'all take that? This is why you take the spiritual gift test. You take that, that spiritual gift test, right, so your gifts can be examined, so we can affirm you, and so that we can deploy you into the place. Yeah. Nobody walks out that room without deciding where they're going to go do ministry. Great Commission don't want fans, right? Like, that, that's not who we are. Paul wasn't interested in being a preacher who just sit there at the apostles' church and never get an opportunity to use his gifts. Right? But just be happy that I'm here. You know? Like, this is what we are called to do. And our vision. Somebody said, well, what happens if we blow up and we get all these people? Are we going to have a mega church? No! We don't build up. We build up. Right. Our vision is to replicate us. Our vision is to have another GCC somewhere else with that same DNA, that same heart, that same biblical preaching and teaching. We're not looking to do three services and build a new church. Not this one. We're looking to reproduce and do it somewhere else. I'm not preaching three times. I don't care how many times you know this. <laughs> you know? But we, we want to see that. We want to see churches centered on building out, not building up. And so we have this affirmation. We have this confirmation. We have God-centeredness, right, versus man-centeredness. And next is partnership. Go back to the text. It says, when James, Cephas, and in verse 9, and John, those recognized as pillars, acknowledged the grace that had been given to me. They gave the right hand of fellowship to me and the Barnabas, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. By giving the right hand of fellowship, this was that an official agreement to serve God together. Right? 
James, uh, 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 Peter, and John, they agreed to reach the circumcision, the Jewish people, while Paul and Barnabas agreed to, to, to reach the uncircumcised, which is the Gentiles. And these pillars, they recognized God's hand on Paul and Barnabas and gave them the right hand of fellowship. Yeah. It's, it's a joy to sit in these meetings, to sit in these interviews and hear the testimonies of what God has done in your life. I know y'all be looking at me strange, like, why he got to get my testimony? That's between me and the Lord. No, that's between you and the Lord <laughs> and the pastor. Right? <laughs> I, I want to know. You know it, it's, no, serious, it's nothing like thinking you're going to heaven and you're going to hell. Like, it, it, it's not really a test for me. It's really affirmation for you. But I'm asking you about your, your testimony, your story. If it's, if it's, I've just been in church all my life. You know you can go to church all your life and still go to hell. Like, we, we need to know that. Like, it got to be a moment in time, right, where I stop being God and I allow God to be God. A moment in time where I recognize I'm broken, I'm a sinner, I need to be saved, I need to be forgiven, I need to be redeemed, my life needs to be transformed. And then there's a moment in time when we don't even have to do something, all we got to do is think it and conviction come. We might not like it, but when it comes to me, I'm like, I know I'm saved, huh? Because I've just been convicted of my thought, right? You might walk out the room and I won't say it to you. So I got away with holding it in. But I still get convicted for thinking. But that's why we ask these questions. And, and, and the pillars recognize that, that God's hand was on Paul and Barnabas. And, and so they gave him this right hand of fellowship. It, it was this sign of agreement that we're going to serve side by side for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe that the church has taken the right hand of fellowship too lightly. I think we really believe that when we join the church, if we just show up on Sunday, drop a little something in the offering, stand up when they tell us to stand up, sit down when they tell us to sit down, that we a good member. <laughs> no. You don't join the body of Christ just to hang out and fellowship together on Sundays. The, the right hand of fellowship is, is, is about this partnership. It's about us coming together, agreeing and understanding our commitment to do life and ministry together. Yeah. See, they knew when they agreed to do this that, that, that they were really agreeing to die together for the cause mm -hmm. yeah. of yeah. that which has saved them. Exactly. That's how serious it was, right? Hand of fellowship was a was a lifelong commitment to partnership. And, and so joining a church should never be like joining a club. Amen. Right? It, it, it's a step of faith that we're agreeing to serve God together to his glory. That's why it, it don't even make sense. I don't even understand why would, would, would you join a, a, a church and, and not want to be involved with his mission? Why would you not wanting to be involved with his ministry. We're agreeing to serve side by, by side for the glory of God, right? And, and so when you come in, we ain't just trying to put you to work, right? We're trying to deploy you to your calling. Because I don't care where you work at in real life, right? I don't care what you do to make your money. God's created you for a purpose. And he created you to be on mission. And that don't mean you have to work in a church and, and be a pastor, but you should be the chaplain on your job. Amen. You should be the go-to person on your block. Yeah. You should be the one in your family that they can call when they need prayer. Yeah. You should be the one they smile when they see coming. Like, you got a mission. You got, and our job is to equip you and prepare you for that ministry that God has called you to. It's not always something that happens inside of the church. In fact, 90% of the ministry of the church should happen outside of the church. There's so many churches where 90% of the church are serving the church. I asked what you do. I, well, I, 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 I do that usher. What, no, what you do in life? No, my ministry on Sunday. I sing on the choir. No, what, no, what do you do for the Lord? You sing on the choir, that's for the church. You usher, that's for church people. You serve in the hospital, that's for church. Right? 
If that's all you do for God, one day out of a week, one hour out of that one day, it serves the church. You got to know that's not your call. You're just using your gift there to bless the body, but that's not the call you have when you're like, that's not why God saved you. To make other Christians feel more comfortable around you. Like we miss the whole calling, the whole God movement of why he saved you and put you on mission when we minimize it down to serving on a Sunday for an hour, hour and a half. And so we get that affirmation and we get that confirmation. We get that God-centered versus man-centered. We get that partnership. And then finally, in, in, in verse 10, he gives us room always for growth. They ask only that we would remember the poor, which I had made every effort to do. So they gave Paul the green light to continue on doing his ministry, preaching the gospel uh, to the Gentiles. They didn't want to change him or, or, or try to force him to conform to anything else. All they told him to do, remember the poor. Remembering the poor is, is, is a calling for them to care about the ostracized and, and the marginalized, the homeless and the helpless. We're not called simply to serve ourselves, amen, on Sundays to make us more comfortable. We're called to communicate and demonstrate the love of Jesus to the lost yes. of the world. There are so many people outside of the doors struggling with life, struggling with the consequences of their choices. We have a call as Christ's ambassadors, commissioned to go and bring love and bring hope and bring a message of deliverance. You should never just desire to find a church that's comfortable for you. You should always be focused on having an opportunity to go fulfill your calling. You should seek a place that's going to stretch you. Right? If I make you feel uncomfortable, that's a good thing. Don't run from feeling uncomfortable. Don't run from feeling convicted. Don't say, how he know my business. That's the Holy Spirit speaking into you, letting you know you where you're supposed to be. Because it's time to grow up. Right? Like sometimes folks get mad. Ah, you stepped on my toes today. Like, hey, I don't really know where your toes is at. It's like, you got shoe in, shoe out, shoes. I don't know, but God knows. And the truth is, our toes should be getting stepped on. Because it means that we're growing. It's not malicious. Right? Holy Spirit is not malicious. The Holy Spirit is convicting and challenging. The, job, the church's job is always to, to push you to go deeper and stronger. It's not to beat you up. And when all those things come together, it brings us to a day like today where we get to celebrate the right hand of fellowship and say, welcome aboard to our new members. Amen. 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 Thank you for that word, Pastor Anderson. Yeah. As he said, it is to welcome those into the fellowship, fellowship, and it begins with you committing and making a decision to follow the Lord today with every head bowed and with every eye closed. I want to make an appeal to someone who may be here today. You have heard Pastor Anderson share in the word today what it means to be a member of a church, a local assembly, the body of Christ. You may be wondering what it means to be saved, to just know that what Jesus has done for you by going to Calvary's cross, being beaten, being tortured, being crucified. It was all because he loved you. When you think about where you are in life, the things that you have done, the things that people try to pull on you about, just know that the Lord loves you in spite of all of those things. And because of what he did on the cross at Calvary, God loves you today. He wants you to know that you can
can make a decision by simply trusting in Jesus. That all of your sins, past, present, and future, are all wiped away. Isn't that good news? For someone who may be here, you need to commit to that. The Lord is calling. He wants you to make a decision to follow him today. It's not about joining a church that is perfect. Because the minute that we all joined it, it was no longer perfect. But to know that you are in a place where folks can love on you with the love of God. Where folks will walk beside you, teach you, show you what it means to be a believer. You found the right place. You're making the right decision. You want to turn away from that life of sin. Won't you raise your hand today? If you have made that decision, won't you raise your hand? Won't you give your life to the Lord today? If you are watching online and you recognize that you are indeed in need of a Savior, you recognize that the life you have lived, have lived are living, stressing you out. You can't do it anymore. Won't you give it to him? Give it to the Lord today. Give it over to him. If you're watching online, won't you repeat this prayer after me? I am a sinner and deserve the punishment for my sin. I believe that Jesus paid the penalty for my sin. And I ask for God's forgiveness. I will follow Jesus and I confess him as Lord and Savior. I receive the free gift of salvation in Jesus Christ today. If you've prayed that prayer along with me and you're watching online, won't you please text us at 267 991-8907 again please text us at 267-991-8907 someone from Great Commission Church will be in touch with you we will let you know what the next steps are as far as committing your life to God today amen if you recognize that you are in need of prayer we are a praying church. If you recognize that you are in need of prayer, we have cards in the pocket of the chair in front of you. Won't you fill that prayer request out? You can submit that. We will take time to pray for you. But if you recognize that all that you have been going through this past week, this past month, you are in need of prayer today. Raise your hand. We'll lift your request to the Lord. I see those hands. I see those hands. Let's look to the Lord. Father, we thank you for how you have allowed us to see another day. You've granted us brand new mercies on this day, Lord, and we thank you for how you continue to shower us with your love, your grace, and your mercy. Father, we pray, Lord, that you would just continue to have your way in our lives, Lord. We pray, God, that you would just help us, Lord, with those things that we may struggle with. Lord, we leave those things at the altar today. Lord, we give those things over to you. Lord, we ask that you would just indeed have your way in our life. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.